Thank you, Sarah. And thank you and congratulations to Laura Riccio and all the other people that have been involved in organizing this conference. It's, uh, it looks like a fantastic program and uh, the conference itself and its topics are perfect for the new school uh, in this context where we have the mix of art, design, politics and historical studies do create a really fertile ground for research in these areas. And we're very grateful to Barry Bergdahl for graciously accepting this invitation to deliver the keynote this evening. He is a colleague for whom we have a great respect. And indeed, just this week, I gather Barry was elected into the nation's most prestigious honorary society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So congratulations for that. That's quite remarkable. He is the Philip Johnson Chief Curator of Architecture and Design at the Museum of Modern Art. He is also a professor of 19th and 20th century architectural history, theory, and criticism at Columbia University. He has been called in a recent press piece the curator who challenged museum audiences to reimagine the American dream and dared New Yorkers to embrace a future of rising sea levels. Yes. <laughs> Interesting combination. Uh, <laughs> he is the organizer of Foreclosed, Rehousing the American Dream, the exhibition portion of which is currently on view at MoMA, as well as last year's Rising Currents, projects for New York's waterfront. And I'm pleased to say that many Parsons faculty were actually in that exhibition. Both of these are multi-platform projects that tackle urgent issues in local, local and national urban planning. His broad interests center on modern architectural history with a particular emphasis on France and Germany between 1750 and 1900. Trained in art history rather than architecture, he has an approach most closely allied with cultural history and the history and sociology of the professions. He has studied questions of the politics of cultural representation in architecture, the larger ideological content of 19th century architectural theory, and the changing role of both architecture as a profession and architecture as a cultural product in 19th century European society. Barry's interests also include the intersections of architecture and new technologies of representation in the modern period, especially photography and film. He has indeed worked on several film productions about architecture, in addition to curating a number of architectural exhibitions concerned with the history and problematics of, exhi of exhibiting architecture and the history of museo museological practices in relationship to architecture. Some of his selected exhibitions and exhibition catalogues include Bauhaus, 1919 to 1933, workshop, Workshops for Modernity, Museum of Modern Art, 2009, and Mies in Berlin, Museum of Modern Art, 2001. He is the author of the Compendium on European Architecture, 1750 to 1890, published by Oxford University Press in 2000. And he received his PhD from Columbia University. We are very pleased and a little intimidated now to welcome Barry Bergdahl to deliver tonight's keynote lecture. Barry, thank you. Well, thank you, and especially thank you to Laura for persuading me to do this. I wish that I could be here to hear all of uh, the papers instead of the small sampling that I'll be, can you hear me, be able to uh, take in. But I put together some thoughts based on the title and the call for papers and then uh, the titles that I had. And I indulged myself to go back and think many years later actually about the first major exhibition that I was involved with, which is related to what you see on the screen, which was an exhibition on the occasion of the bicentennial of the French Revolution. So I thought I need to uh, <clears throat> to take on the revolution again. So uh, I, you never asked me for a title, so I made up one, but I didn't make the usual bad graphics uh, sign that usually announces all PowerPoints. So, but I called this design and in, for, and from revolutionary change. So um, it is for a moment I thought maybe the PowerPoint won't work, and I thought actually maybe the illustrations that are auxiliary to this, but you can tell me um, in the end. But I asked myself a qu one question, which I hope resonates with across the board with the, the work that you've done and it's represented by this impressive array of papers. Now, it seems to me that it is perhaps no mistake that the history of art as a discipline came of age in the period of two of the revolutions, which you see on the screen, which still mark profoundly the political and economic regimes in which we live. The Industrial Revolution, usually said to have, been, have begun around 1750 and to have continued for nearly a century, and the French Revolution, a revolution which could pinpoint its origin to a specific historical threshold, 
even a particular time of day, on the 14th of July, 1789, and which by a decade later had essentially given way or morphed into something far different, a regime with all the outward signs of revived imperialism. Like these revolutions, both economic and political, the history of art was from the first a discipline about change and movement. To go to the two conflicting etymologies usually given for the word revolution, to revolve as in astronomy, where the first applications occurred, and to turn around as to change radically and suddenly in order of affairs, whether by revolving to an older, or supposedly older, state of being, or by introducing something radically new, unprecedented even. Now clearly, in those two definitions, and perhaps in these two revolutions on the screen, we are looking at two different temporal time frames, one posited on continuities, the other on ruptures, the one on regular processes, the other on discontinuities. Which ultimately is the more meaningful for design in the largest sense might then be one of our, your questions here. And I wonder if there were introductory comments that I might be echoing uh, without knowing it, but that would be nice. Now indeed this was the very threshold that faced the history of art at its modern origins in the 18th century. Whether it was a discipline, a form of knowledge which describes slow change taking place within an autonomous evolution of form, or whether change in the morphology and even the functions of works of art could be affected programmatically by decree. We might trace the revolutionary change even in the notion of the history of art, from the idea that, it, that its purpose was to trace the legitimacy of monarchies and belief systems, validating their in antiquity, to the idea that art itself could be an instrument of radical change, of societal restructuring, functions moreover that would never fully supersede one another. Paradoxically, then, the history of art was founded in the revolutionary decades on two seemingly contradictory perceptions. One, that works of art reflected the state of society. Now, this idea, of course, ran from Johann uh, Winkelmann's History of Art of 1764, which happens to be exactly contemporary with the image. I'll spend a great deal of time on. This is the foundation model of the Church of St. Genevieve uh, in, in, in Paris with the head of Louis XV. So Winkelmann's idea that the works of art reflected the state of society uh, which runs up, and we can find many, many echoes of it, even beyond what I'm taking as a stopping point for the moment, the French romantic literary and artistic critic, theorist Hippolyte Fortoul, who declared in 1841, each time you witness a, cha a change of artistic forms, you can be sure that society has changed as well. Art, he said, is the handwriting of culture. And now the second contradictory, I suppose paradoxically, the second uh, seemingly contradictory perception that I cited, that the state of society could be altered by deploying changes in the formal characteristics and meaning structures of works of art, something that can be seen in the important role cultural policy has played in every major political revolution since 1789. And for that, I'm showing you something I'll return to, uh, one of the many projects that was formulated in relationship to the famous competitions of the year two that was meant to define a brand new architecture for a brand new situation, the situation of Republican France. Now the French Revolution was, is this the right thing to do? No, it's the wrong thing to do. Um, the French Revolution was to be a prototype for all the other violent political revolutions of the 19th and 20th centuries. Even if the first use of the term revolution was for the glorious revolution, of course, which had overthrown James II a full century earlier. The French Revolution then is prototyped from the Russian Revolution of 1917 to the Mexican Revolution of 1919, the Chinese Revolution of 1949, and its subsequent cultural revolution to the Cuban Revolution of 1959 to cite but a few. So perhaps by focusing this evening on this period over the course of the late 18th and early 19th century, I might offer you some thoughts of use in general for your discussion tomorrow here, uh, your discussion here about the relationship between revolution and design. A vast enterprise, I would say, that the organizers of the conference have carved out, which takes on nothing short of the very discipline of art history and its search to de devise a method for understanding everything from the evolution of form to the sequence of style, to the instrumental relationship between design and society. So I will focus in this sea of possibilities on the events around 1789. Now indeed, as, oops, sorry about that. I want to go this one. There are too many choices here. Um, maybe I want to escape from that. Okay, there we go. 
Now, indeed, as Anthony Vidler uh, pointed out in a brilliant essay written, in fact, for another symposium, one of countless symposiums, held in association with the celebrations in 1988 to 89 of the Bicentennial of the French Revolution, the dialectical pair of neologisms, which you see personified here, vandalism and curator, was born of the revolution. These are two absolutely wonderful images. It's the same person in guise of these, Alexandre Lenoir uh, on the left as protecting us against vandalism or vandalisme, a brand new word in the 1790s, and on the other uh, in the guise of an, another brand new word and a brother, another brand new um, function uh, for human activity, conservateur or curator. So both vandalisme and curator, conservateur, born of the revolution. Both tied here to the key personage of Alexandre Lenoir, who not only sir, sought to save artifacts from violent destruction, as you can see here in the uh, Abbey of Saint-Denis, uh, from the violent destruction at the hands of the sans-culottes, he's trying to convince the sans-culottes that the royal graves at Saint-Denis are not the graves of kings, but are in fact the works of national genius. Uh, not to be seen as forms of oppression, but as forms of cultural uh, heritage uh, and um, identity. So an extremely important uh, moment uh, for us and for the history of art. And to translate them then uh, on the other screen uh, to, uh, in fact, uh, objects uh, to be venerated. We could call this a kind of willed cultural amnesia or clean slate. But equally, he sought to protect them then, I said, as I, uh, I would argue, by giving them both sanctuary but even more importantly, a new meaning. The meaning, we might say, of the history of art. And a new order in his Musée des Monuments Français, the first museum in history to be organized systematically by a notion of chronology and of rise and fall, perhaps the other meaning of revolution. Now, in this remarkable act of decontextualization and recontextualization, let me give you a mini tour of this now famous museum. We go from the 13th century room to the 15th century room, various rooms, each dedicated to a century rather than the reign of a monarch. So another image of it there. It culminates here before the decline. It was actually an image about the recent decline uh, of art, but that has been long forgotten. It's somehow been remembered as a celebration of the Middle Ages. In fact, it was a portrait of the rise and fall of style. Now, in this remarkable act of decontextualization and recontextualization, a short-lived but powerfully influential museum was born uh, of the project of writing a history of art that su could support the forging of a national identity for citizens rather than subjects. A history of art by style rather than by reigns, it motors a more complex relationship of form to social forms than simply the relationship between royal patron and artists and artisans. Art itself might be the artisan of social and political change and a new consciousness was, post, was posited. It was one of the great experiments of linguistic reversal, of the detournement of signification, by which the French Revolution sought, no, sought not only to create unprecedented new forms and new experiences, but also to recast heritage into new narratives, into new structures, indeed, of meaning. Now, we will examine several of them in the course of this brief talk, but it is worth remembering, I think, at the outset, how fundamentally the history of art itself was born of such acts. It's, I'm not going to really talk about this, but I thought I'd just give it to you as background to the next part. Very interesting. This is Boulet designing a museum in 1780. So this is a museum in which no works of art are depicted. Uh, this is rather interesting, the notion of actually trying to design a museum before its program existed. The museum, in fact, as an ambiance, as an atmosphere, as an experience, as a state of consciousness, and the possibility of architecture, in fact, to create that consciousness so that the institution itself might be possible. So although the relationship of shaping place and the politics of bodies in space is, of course, as old as the history of political power, a preoccupation as much then, I, I guess, of archaeologists as of modernist art historians, like most of us gathered here, the conscious deployment of that towards a new aesthetic, with the, uh, <clears throat> along with it, which, uh, with the claim uh, of a self-conscious uh, fabrication uh, of, of that consciousness is, I think, a product of modernity since the 18th century. And here we arrive at the essence of our question of the relationship of design to slow-scale processes that restructure society, like the scientific or industrial revolutions, and violent upheavals, let's go into the museum, and violent upheavals with the implantation of redesigned societies, which inevitably involve the radical rethinking of architecture and design in that notion that society itself 
can be designed. Here we might put into juxtaposition two contemporary designs. Uh, one, an artifact of the French Revolution. See, I have them here. They're, these are out of order. The juxtaposition slide is here. Um, one, an artifact of the French Revolution on the right, the other of the Industrial Revolution on the left, that nonetheless had equal ambition, both of which respond to the observations of the Dr. Pierre-Jean Georges Cabigny, a noted physiologist and material philosopher who noted bef uh, months before the French Revolution, quote, whenever one gathers a group of people, one alters their mode of behavior. One, uh, I suppose I've done that tonight. When, w when one gathers them in an enclosed space, now it gets scary, one alters at once their modes of behavior and their health. Now I am thinking, of course, here of these two images of Jeremy Bentham's uh, designed for the Panopticon, whose rediscovery by Michel Foucault has engendered a veritable branch of architectural history of instrumental design, and of the design in the same year by, here we have it, uh, by a team of architects under the direction of Jacques Sellerier for the Festival of the Federation, held to commemorate the first anniversary of the Revolution on July 14, 1790. That in itself is rather interesting, this revolutionary break from the past that is immediately involved in historical activity and commemoration. And in itself the prototype uh, for revolutionary festivals by which designers fundamentally reshape the city and the everyday experience of it. Now both Bentham and Salarier, we'll go back to our comparative slide, uh, sought to invent a machine for change a machine which would alter both behavior and consciousness, one which would have effects both during and after use and leave residue in those who had used it. One might say, uh, one we might say was born of the Industrial Revolution, the other of the French Revolution, one born of utilitarian desire to maximize efficiency in all domains of society and economic life, the other of a patriotic desire to foster a new citizenry's civic pride and commitment. Both sought to instrumentalize two generations, what we could call the Enlightenment's reflection on the design of space to predictable instrumental ends, a discourse instead of artistic experiments in which architectural design itself was thought of as both a laboratory and a laboratory instrument. And I should just explain in case you, I mean, I, I'm assuming by now that anyone who does not know the Panopticon would not be allowed into a school. It has been. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so systematically understood, not through the writings of Bentham, of course, but through the writings of Foucault, uh, and, uh, but maybe less on this side, uh, this rather extraordinary design in which the entire audience was put on display to look at itself, uh, looking at the um, altar uh, of the La, la Patrie uh, to, uh, in a kind of almost um, mass uh, uh, communal uh, national baptism, in, uh, in a way, uh, where the people themselves become uh, a spectacle, with then this wonderful image of uh, uh, a allegorical figure we're going to see over and over again in the next few images, the image of fame uh, coming in and trumpeting the architectural plan, actually, it, wonderfully, the kind of plan uh, here uh, celebrated uh, as an instrument of, uh, of transformation and of nation building. Now, progressively, in the second half of the 18th century, uh, the Industrial Revolution sought to rationalize space in relationship to productivity and profit. It is too often forgotten that Bentham, the father of utilitarianism, thought of the Panopticon as a universal machine, not simply as an ideal prison, as many architectural historians seem to think because Foucault brilliantly analyzed it as a paradigm of new political relations in a modern disciplinary society where observation and control became part of the very fabric of social relations. But for Bentham, the panopticon, and I, I think that's actually interesting to think about because Foucault's model is at once uh, opens up tenfold the implications uh, of Bentham's um, uh, a project. But it is in some ways actually also one that as it's been interpreted particularly by architectural historians and architects, uh, extremely limiting and forgetting that this was actually not a design for an ideal prison. But if Foucault, uh, Bentham thought actually a, uh, an object that would have incredible number of multiple applications. For Bentham, the panopticon was applicable to a whole range of uses, not only of a perfect device for a prison, where the spatial arrangement allowed the running of a prison with a minimal of disciplinary personnel, a single guard could control the whole prison, even a notional single guard, which was the diabolical brilliance of the scheme, scheme of course, uh, for, both, uh, for both the utilitarian Bentham 
and for the institutional critique of Foucault. But equally, the building might be a model workhouse, constructed of iron and glass, Bentham tells us, to allow for a completely fireproof structure with maximum daylight for maximum factory productivity. Now, within years, the modern factory building, I think I have a few more images of this fantastic, oh no, it goes. There's a few more images of the festival. Within years, the modern factory building would, in fact, be perfected as the perfect machine itself. Not only would the building organize bodies in space to create the worker as a cog in the serial work of, for instance, weaving, but the building itself would be designed to allow for the most efficient layout of the machines, engineered even such, as you see here, so that the incorporation of water-driven energy and overhead pulleys and machinery were dependent on the architecture, such as in the extraordinary mill at Belper here in Derbyshire. A new architecture, new machinery, and a new notion of the movements of the, of the worker were an integral process. Quickly, workers' housing laid out in rows upon row of brick dwellings would surround the factory. Capital's conquest of space, something we discuss today as globalization, would not be confined to the factory. Here, design innovations that would influence architecture for decades, up until the great extension of this system, in the work of Albert Kahn for Henry Ford in Highland Park and for the Packard Company, in Detroit in the early 20th century created the culmination of the first industrial revolution in perfected machines for turning the automobile into not only the perfect personal transport device but into the ultimate consumer object. Until Jeremy Bentham's invention of the panopticon, the industrial re revolution designed more by necessity than by intent, accommodating the demands for productivity. Design was almost an act of uncritical accommodation a making possible, an optimization of, ex uh, of existing programs or functions. The utilitarian factory that, that would become one of the dominant metaphors of the modern movement in its critique of the 19th century's obsession with historical signification and what we might call the tagging of architecture was created as a ruthless pursuit of efficiency and optimization. Its social effects were largely consequences rather than intents but they radically transformed hundreds and thousands of lives within a half century of their invention. Quite the opposite was the sudden deployment of new inventions by the chaotic forces of the rebellion that had by 1794 named itself the French Revolution. Here architects were charged with a task that had sometimes been anticipated by a generation of designers. If in, now I'm going to take you back to this case study uh, of, the, uh, of the Pantheon, uh, what became the Pantheon, the Church of St. Genevieve here. Uh, if in 1764, Julien David Le Roy, and this is an image which anyone who's had the misfortune of studying with me knows that I remain obsessed. I think it sums up uh, the 18th century notion of, uh, of history. I think it sums up the 18th century aspirations of the perfection uh, of architecture. And in this case, it is an extraordinary piece in which history and political propaganda come together. Because here, uh, Julien David Lois, arguably French, France's first professional architectural historian, portrays one of the grandest undertakings of Louis XV's reign, or two of them for that matter, and that is uh, here, the Church of the Madeleine uh, and the uh, Church of Saint Genevieve, both of which had their uh, cornerstones uh, laid in ceremonies within uh, the same year, and both of which are directly related uh, to an attempt to salvage uh, the, uh, uh, the reign. Uh, they're portrayed then not only as uh, simply as an act of royal propaganda, but in fact as a historical further step in the perfection or evolution of the ideal uh, church plan. So, as I always like to say when I show this in, in classes, if you could imagine that you'd gone to the eye doctor and you had this sort of, like, how far in history can you read? Uh, the problem of this eye chart uh, is essentially, uh, as you can see, how can you marry two impossible things? How can you marry open space of the Christian's transformation of the ancient Roman basilica into a open prayer space, the box in the upper left corner with all of its whiteness, and add to it a dome, which is the symbol, of course, of the celestial presence of God on earth, in order to create a new thing, the Christian church for an earlier revolution, uh, what we might call the Christian uh, revolution of the fourth century. And of that merger is meant to therefore come a radical new experiment. Because a, uh, a, a, a gridded plan and a dome, which requires enormously heavy support, do not um, marry very well. So this is a structural and ideological problem 
from the fourth century until its complete and utter perfection under Louis XV in 1764 with the reachievement of an open white spatial plan upon which is superimposed this extremely heavy structure of a height never reached and of a sophistication uh, of structuring never achieved by the uh, Romans. So, but we wouldn't stop here. There it, uh, there it is. Uh, but within a few years later, the next generation of architects would begin to work with the problem of creating the form, uh, cr not only this form, but for creating, as we'll see in a moment, forms for unprecedented programs. So if what you see on the screen, Etienne Louis Boulet's design of about 1880 for the Metropole, a great metropolitan cathedral, might take its place as yet a further link in the chain of the progressive perfection of the type that I just showed you inherited from late, late antiquity, or the perfect machine for the celebration of the central mysteries of Christianity, both a place for total vision of the host on the altar and for the enactment of the liturgy, and a machine for manipulating light, which the architect can now do, to make manifest the divine presence. He's, Boulet also sought to make a monument in the same year to the scientific revolution, one that would create an architecture of unprecedented form, one that could be celebrated both as a total invention, he may be the first person, perhaps Piranesi aside, to have proclaimed to have invented an architecture, and to be an instrument for the sensation of secular belief. And this in the famous design here for Senatov to Isaac Newton. Now here Boulet hoped to show that architectural art could rival science as a means of exploring the laws of nature that the laws of concurrent fascination in artistic and philosophical circles with the theory of sensation, or the effects of forms on the sensations, on the emotions, and in the end on knowledge and morals, could be perfected by artistic invention. I quote from Boulet. Sublime mind, prodigious and profound genius, at this point it's clear, I'm not clear whether he's addressing someone else or himself. <laughs> oh, Newton, he wrote in an almost secular prayer to this great scientific mind of the 17th century. With the range of your intelligence and the sublime nature of your genius, you have defined the shape of the earth. I have conceived the idea of enveloping you in your discovery. Now, Boulet, in his ambition to create a veritable encyclopedia of architectural inventions for a whole range of new purposes, uh, like uh, 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 Claude Nicolas Ledoux, who was in these same years to expand his commission for the design of a perfect factory at the uh, salt works of Arquesenon. You see the famous plan of it. And I know these are all textbook examples. I'm just trying to bring them back in relationship to the problematic uh, of where does design change take place in the scientific revolution of slow progress or in the political revolution that we're going to see uh, emerging shortly afterwards. Both of them were to expand these experiments into attempts to create an allegorical encyclopedia of modern building types. And here in Ledoux's case, chosen at random a design for the pacifier. There were never pacifiers before this one was thought of, and in fact there never were. Uh, a sort of family conflict for resolving, a uh, family court for resolving conflicts. It uh, forms at once a symbolic of and productive of harmony. So the idea is that actually by entering into a perfect cube, you would achieve a state of stability and a feeling of wholeness that would make it possible for the adjudicator to apply the, uh, the tenets of family law, which are on the tablets uh, on the outside of this design. So its forms, as I say, at once symbolic and productive of harmony through the groundedness of the square and the focus of the cylinder. Now, it was with the background of this experimentation, a body of work that 20th century art historians like Emil Kaufmann would label paradoxically revolutionary architecture, despite the fact that all of this work was done before the events of 1789, and that neither Boulet nor Ledoux would be entrusted with much work during the revolutionary decade. Ledoux, indeed, relegated in a moment during the 1790s to prison. Here, revolutionary had more to do with the formal characteristics of the architecture, with an internal history of what Kaufman called autonomous form. Although it was precisely in these forms that many architects in the service of the revolution would seek to define an architecture of revolution. It was in any case the legacy upon which the, rev the revolution would build from everything from the redesign of the Salle des Menus Plaisirs. This is, of course, uh, where all of the foundational acts of the first months of the revolution took place. And I only put in one slide, but one of the, one of the great deliberations that takes place in this room is redesigning this room. And so it was decided, this is its first state, it was decided to move the Diaz 
to the long side in order actually, therefore, spatially, to completely restructure the political, uh, the political relations and the individual relations of the self-same uh, individuals uh, in uh, this room. So it was there, as far as I say, upon this legacy of Boulay and Ledoux and the entire Enlightenment reflection on the relationship of form to behavior to consciousness and ultimately even to political identity that the revolution would build uh, nearly everything from the redesign uh, of the Salle des Menus Plaisirs, an old place for royal ceremonies, now to serve as the assembly hall for the Etat Généraux, uh, to the call in 1794 for what I've already evoked here in the competitions of the year two, for the design of a whole array of new buildings needed for the fundamental institutional reform of French administrative and daily life in the competitions for every single building that would be required to build everything from the scale of the city to the village. I'm not going to go into these, but these are just some examples of them. A temple of equality, temple of liberty, uh, the assembly for a subsection, a provincial version with the new constitution inscribed in the facade, a altar to the uh, victims of the, uh, uh, of the uh, country, the fight for the country, the fight for the fatherland, a theater, of course, and we can put all of that in the sense of this uh, reversal. Now, it was on the real ground of French cities and towns that the challenges of radical rupture were to be play out. Nothing ever came of this uh, competitions of the year two. Uh, putting, in a sense, uh, then on the ground to the test the idea of a total design of an architecture without precedent that could affect by abstract means the bodily relation of geometric sensation, even with minimal recourse to reference, to the ways in which history endow form and shapes with culturally accrued meaning. 150 years then, I should keep on this slide for these comments, 150 years before the experiments of 20th century architecture, the idea of building a new vocabulary was written in one of the first great social experiments, a total revolution that moved from a claiming of ancient rights to an audacious experiment to rewrite social relations. So here we have the pulling down of the statue of uh, the king on the Place des Victoires and the design of the costumes for the legislators so that even daily wear, the daily, uh, this was a revolution of form that extended even to the uniform, as we might say. We might say that all of this was to begin with language. Overnight, the king's subjects were to become citizens, citoyens, and the changing of written and spo spoken language was to be accompanied by a vast experimentation in changing the visual environment as well, not merely in the manipulation of symbols, although there was going to be a vast amount of this to be sure, but also in creating instruments to reinforce and create new social relations that were to be invented rather than allowed to evolve. The fundamental relationship of space, time, and even measure were to be affected. Space was tackled first, as projects for the dismantling of the Bastille uh, aimed to redesign the space as a symbol of the new nation. So there's the prison at the moment of the uh, uh, of this storming of the Bastille, and as we all know famously from Michelet and others, there weren't actually that many people there. This was largely a symbolic gesture, but this was, uh, within a few months, declared the beginning of actually a much longer uh, historical process. And what had already been in debate, and this is too often forgotten, <laughs> that Louis XVI wanted to tear down the Bastille, uh, the uh, Bastille was demolished as an act of the citizens demolishing the old order in order to make way for the, the new. But in this linguistic reversal of this absolute symbol of repression uh, of the old order was overnight turned into almost like a Christian saint in the way that Christian saints always bear the symbol of their martyrdom as proof of their virtue. Uh, the Bastille became, for instance, in this project of a column to the nation and to liberty, the Bastille itself rebuilt as a small model of itself in the creation of an iconography of the new French Republic. And indeed, Catherine de Quincy would propose that the figure of liberty would, act, would give the Bastille uh, as, a, uh, as a symbol, and now almost a symbol of uh, her martyrdom, uh, to the figure of the mother or the uh, fatherland. So overnight, the Bastille transformed from symbol of oppression into one of liberation. And I would call this one of the first acts of linguistic reversal that were once to be the building blocks of revolutionary design and the sources, in the end, I'd like to say, of their instability. Space was transformed at every level, if we need the sign of, uh, of uh, I, this is what you're going to hear for the next few minutes, is this 
attempt of the revolution out of a moment of rupture to create something that is perpetual and founded and inviolable. Uh, and I think you can see very clearly corners I photographed in Bordeaux. Uh, and you can see uh, that what is today uh, the Rue de l'Hôtel de Ville, there in a short, had originally been the street of the Royal Palace, the Rue du Palais Royal, uh, and then had become the street of the Parliament. Then it became the street of the beloved tree. Uh, over here, we have the Rue Montbazon today, which is a return to its 18th century name, but under the revolution, it was the, the Rue J'adore l'égalité. I adore <laughs> equality. Um, so here we see, um, would say that streets would be renamed as the daily environment became a lesson in new values, a technique that would mark every political revolution for the next two centuries, or more as the first, to, uh, um, since of course the easiest thing to change are the street signs. The easiest to change into a certain sense with the greatest consequence for affecting our sense of ourselves when you no longer live at the same place. This is a technique that has even been borrowed in 20 than 21st century terms by suburban developers who inevitably name a laid out subdivision after that which they have destroyed. Old Farm Road, you can be certain, is a new suburban subdivision. Here we see the palimpsest of such attempts to reorder space in Bordeaux. But this was carried on in the redrawing of the map of France into departments rather than provinces, all of which were to be logical. In fact, they were to be 89 in number, quite coincidentally. The Abbe Gregoire, one of the great theorists and activists of the period, proposed that the public, public monuments should henceforth bear inscriptions in French rather than Latin, and that this changing of street names should be coordinated to create a new revolutionary geography, he proposed that the street of virtue would lead to the street of equality, and so on and so forth. When one reconstructs a government from scratch, he writes, no single abuse should escape reform. The legislator who doesn't take account of the importance of signs will fail at his mission. He should not let escape any occasion for grabbing hold of the senses for awakening Republican ideas. No less was the calendar to be restructured, beginning in 1793 with the year one, the year of the passage of the Constitution. And by 1795, architects would not, uh, would not only be signing their designs uh, with their name followed by citoyen, but following a new system of measurement, uh, as well as a new system of measuring time, using the new metric system based on the circumference of the world, uh, world rather than on the notional foot of the king. Now, until very recently, historians of French architecture have been little interested in the revolution, even if it was one of the central topics of French history or modern history in general. Architectural historians preferring to see it as a troubling hiatus rather than a productive period, or as I would argue, a watershed of new architectural ideas, even if in many cases the forms had been conceived without the full exploitation of their possible potentials until radically different circumstances had come to pass. And architectural historians have been quick to point out the continuities between the 1780s and the 18-teens and 1820s, as though the revolution had not affected a stylistic shift equivalent to the shift, say, from the Renaissance to the Baroque, which in the late 19th century was the very paradigm of art historical stylistic change. In France, academic institutions were indeed quickly reinstated, and architecture did not even need to wait, as did the other arts, for Napoleon to do this. There seemed a certain stylistic continuity in the early 1800s with the work of the 1780s, even if there was an enormous social, political, and economic change. Now, I remember picking up, and you'll excuse me, this passage into autobiography, uh, as I was finishing the work on this, a two-year research project that resulted in 1989 in the exhibition and catalog on the French Pantheon, the former Church of Saint Genevieve, Le Pantheon, Symbole des Révolutions. A then brand new, also in the bookstore, next to my new book, I was very proud, it was one of the first I'd done, uh, a brand new one volume dictionary on the revolution. Eager to see to what extent this volume, aimed at a fairly broad audience, had absorbed the recent research and reevaluation of the architectural impact of the revolution, I turned to that entry, oh, architecture. All the more as the bicentennial of the revolution took place against what no one suspected when we had begun our work in the mid-1980s, the protests in Tiananmen Square in Beijing and the protests in the Eastern Bloc that led to the breaching of the Berlin Wall on November 9th of that year. I found instead in that dictionary a blunt and concise statement of the standard view. The entry architecture was astoundingly short, even almost as short as the entry architect in Flaubert's dictionary of received ideas. Uh, all the more we know, um, 
uh, astoundingly short. All the more shocking, I would say, since we know that in Paris alone, in the early 1790s, one-fifth of the city's la land changed ownership. That entry began, one knows that in times of war and political unrest, there is no money for architecture. Yet some of the most interesting work in recent years in scholarship has taken uh, into architecture what historians have long known. The times of war and revolution mark a society in the most tra traumatic ways. Some recent studies on the effects of World War II on the transformation of the practices and economies of American architecture come to mind here. While architecture might sometimes be called upon after the fact to mask over the rupture, it scarcely remains unaffected. It was this that we set out to study in the exhibition on the Pantheon, where the Pantheon served as the veritable crucible for witnessing the dramatic emergence of modern instability in meaning. While all the scholarship on the Church of St. Genevieve from 1791, the Pantheon, to date, had been content to document the history of the architect Jacques Germain Soufflot's commission, and here you see it in its uh, almost final form, this beautiful set of renderings, uh, the extraordinary section which revealed the extent to which light and these, uh, the incredible presence of windows uh, in uh, this building was part of the aesthetic uh, for letting light uh, animate the interior forms. And we're going to see that's going to all be erased uh, in, uh, within a few years. These windows are not to be seen today. But in any case, all uh, histories of this to date had been content to uh, document the evolution of the design and then the saga of construction which led up to the creation of these neo-Gothic forms in order to support the very heavy tripartite dome, under the assumption, typical art historical assumption, that no matter how protracted the historical period in which the drama of design and construction unfolds, that the subject of architectural history, like art history, is the realization of works of architecture by master architects. Obstacles to realization or delays are not subjects of study at least not by American architectural history, although they might sometimes be in Germany with its distinction between Baugeschichte and Geschichte der Architektur. What interested us in the exhibition was a question posed over and over again by the revolution. What happens when you decide to change the function, this really tells you what the dome is about, right? Levitation, uh, that's uh, Saint Genevieve. What happens when you decide to change, she's uh, buried at that spot. Um, so the dome tells us where she is. Um, what happens when you decide to change the function, form, use, and even the political resonance of a monument? And what happens when you continue to do that over the course of no fewer than seven regimes in less than a century, from the events of July 1789 to the culture wars between different visions of the state, between an ultra-Catholic right and a republic left exactly a century later? I wanted to condemn this to the 19th century, but the current elections bring it back to a certain actuality. Uh, on one level here was a test case to look at a crisis in architectural meaning in the period from a different point of view. On the other hand, by taking as a subject the life history of a building over a century, it challenged the idea that the leading architectural ideas of any period are necessarily exclusively or even primarily invested in new buildings. Even as the historian Francois Forêt was assembling his great text in which he popularized and extended his long-held beliefs that the whole history of 19th century France could be viewed as an extension of the revolutionary propositions. This is important for us. In this sense, the French Revolution becomes a process rather than an event. Uh, an extension of the revolutionary propositions of the 1780s and 1790s. We set up a new kind of laboratory in the exhibition to look at the Pantheon as one of the most extraordinary sites of that century long history. With the subtitle from the uh, De l'Église de la Nation à la Temple des Grands Hommes, from the Church of the Nation to the Temple of Great Men, the exhibition catalog proposed that through the politics of retooling a royal self-image, here you see the king coming to lay the cornerstone of that church be before a simulacrum of its future um, uh, portico. Uh, here you see the spreading of that great royal act through printmaking make sure that it would reach far and wide for those who had not attended this highly politicized uh, architectural um, uh, cornerstone laying. Of course, in the cornerstone would be embedded this object, almost like a kind of sacred uh, cult object, uh, along with, of course, the relics of St. Genevieve herself. 
So we propose that the, through the politics of retooling a royal self-image in Soufflot's project, one could track the many ways in which the late reign of Louis XV in particular began to pursue a reform set of policies, policies and the cultivation of a notion of the nation as being invested in something outside the personage of the king. So in other words, there were actually political moves within kingship that were themselves suggestive of reactions to uh, Enlightenment ideas, uh, as well as a kind of crafting of a modernization and self-survival uh, of the monarchy. It was in the very forms of Soufflot's designs and the ways in which it was staged and evolved that one can actually read, often in advance of other forms of discourse, this radical evolution of the Ancien Regime in what turned out to be its twilight years. Now the great transformation of the building, excuse me, I think we should stick with this, that Soufflot had conceived of as the most perfect church, the veritable culmination of the development of the dome basilican type since antiquity, was now to be desacralized. In fact, it had never in fact been consecrated and given a new secular back baptism as a pantheon to house the tombs in memory of great men, kinds of secular saints in the form of great literary and philosophical figures. Voltaire and Rousseau, uh, imagined uh, now, from now on to be great friends, would be among the few pre-revolutionary figures admitted, and, the, and along with them, great men of state. These, in turn, would be sites for contemplation. So here are the tombs of the great men, in this case, Diderot, um, and for the new role of civic education. This is a father teaching his son in the forms of citizenship rather than a religious belief. Uh, in what had been the crypt for the monks, but was now the crypt for les grands hommes, great men on whom one could be role models for a young boy. Um, these, in turn, would become sites for contemplation and for the new role of civic education that would replace the former role of religious instruction embedded in the family. It was not only a new building that needed to be invented within the shell of an old one, but a whole new program. And it is this that emerges in times of revolution and war, an architecture that is born not only of new formal types, but of self-conscious redesigns of program. Architecture is not simply a mirror of society here, it is an agent, at times a stimulus. This was self-consciously uh, explored. Here's the building rewritten, re-edited. The windows gone in order to create a more somber atmosphere. Uh, the cross replaced by the, a proposed figure uh, of fame to tell you that the grands hommes uh, are buried uh, in, the, in the crypt. And of course, all the sculpture work changed changed. This was self-consciously exploited during the revolution where, for instance, the whole field of festival design could be, and here's one of them, the uh, reburial of Voltaire. Voltaire turned out to be a very difficult problem because it turned out that his body was in an abbey, and so his body was about to be secularized and sold off as private property along with the abbey, and they're very, it's this great movement. Can we sell Voltaire? Because how could Voltaire, a great intellectual forerunner of the revolution become private property and sold on the liberalizing market. And so it was decided that he had to become property of the nation and to be transferred his ashes in this great ceremony staged by our friend Sellerier uh, to take him to the Pantheon. The environments here become rather remarkably like an ancient Roman city in this view, whereas somehow miraculously three years later Rousseau was taken to a Pantheon in the middle of the countryside. It looks almost like Hermenonville, uh, where of course the entire cast of characters from Emile uh, was present for this dramatic transfer. Um, in any case, uh, we might say that all of this was self-consciously explored during the revolution where, for instance, the whole field of festival design could be regarded as one of the largest of those experiments in the modification of behavior and beliefs through spatial configurations. Not empty spatial configurations, but configurations of bodies into mass ornaments. There's Voltaire's burial, and there's the staging of how this will take place. A theme we generally associate with Siegfried Krakauer's analysis of fascist aesthetics and early movie culture. But in addition to the attempt to modify through design, there is the interesting phenomena of trying to come to terms with co-opting the symbolic and spatial power of the existing city. Soufflot's church was such a dominant, you know, other examples, frequently these festivals would involve actually rebaptizing many different stages in the city, leading up to, of course, here the great altar of nature and of the fatherland. Um, Soufflot's church was such a dominant addition to the Paris skyline, its monumental forms so marked by royal ceremony and intent, and its daring so marked by grand claims, that it could never again, in a sense, be ignored. Here's the birth of instability. Each successive regime felt compelled within weeks of coming to power to claim this building, 
and to refashion it to its own ends within weeks of coming to power. Far from an eternal symbol, symbol eternal of enlightenment ideals, the building became a veritable barometer of political change, something in a sense always in becoming. Here's a project for Devayi to deal with the structural problems of the dome, but also to take down St. Genevieve and use a pyramid to honor the Grand Zone, but also to transform it into an observatory. You see there's a staircase that you can ascend to a point to look out past statues of the Grand Zone to the panorama of Paris as though the Grand Zone had built Paris rather than the kings. So now this building, therefore, as I say, a, a barometer of political change, something in a sense always in becoming, and a constant provocation to the underlying soundness of the belief in monumental expression and the specificity of architectural meaning, which was one of the preoccupations of architects in this period of multiplying new building types and new social functions. It was then the opposite of the work of building uh, new buildings in specific historic styles for their semantic exactness or historical associations, a kind of irritant to the entire historicist project of the 19th century. So here are just some examples of proposals. Under the Restoration Across, under the monarchy of July, uh, a, uh, a form of the nation. Uh, here we have uh, a um, Daumier cartoon that's wonderful with the proposal. Uh, as Napoleon III was trying to uh, court the church, he proposed that maybe he would give back the Pantheon to the church. This is uh, Daumier showing Montalembert assaulting the Pantheon in order to take back the Capucins. So we might say, very interesting, this building sort of drops out of the history of 19th century because, of course, it's not a new building. It's just a continued uh, political uh, strategy, a kind of political stake. Uh, and it runs opposite, in that certain sense, we might say, to the main lines of architectural theory from which so much architectural history is, is written. The history of building new buildings in specific historical styles for their semantic exactness of historical association. Indeed, the opposite even of restoring monuments, this new art of monumental restoration, to states of historical perfection, which, as Ville le Duc himself, the author of so many of these theories noted, might never have actually existed historically. And it was the very reason that, for me, the fate of this monument in the 19th century became such a fascinating study. There is not a literature on monumental appropriation in the 19th century. There is not a theory to be studied, as one would say, turn to Pugin's True Principles or Ville Duc's Dictionary to study the Gothic Revival, for instance, or in the 20th century to Le Corbusier's Vers une architecture to study purism. Yet the examples can be multiplied, and they take us to the heart of nearly every city which has experienced radical change. It was as much a task for the architects of Napoleon's Paris as it was for Lenin's Moscow, of Castro's Havana, where we are here on this screen, or Helmut Kohl's Berlin, or even now, of Hugo Chavez's Caracas, uh, alas not, of Obama's Washington. Which revolutions are, in the end, more productive of radical design change? The longer-term structural revolutions, such as the scientific revolutions of the 17th and 18th century, and the first industrial revolution of the 18th and 19th, or the violent upheavals that have marked the face of Paris, Havana, Beijing, Moscow, St. Petersburg, Berlin, and countless other cities around the globe. As I have tried to show, much of the programmatic design of revolution is on the order of propaganda. Its forms closely tied to what it was to deny or overthrow. Its claims often as much about recuperating a past, even a mythic past, a prelapsarian past, than necessarily projecting a future. One thinks, for instance, of the radical, and rarely emulated efforts here on the screen of the Cuban Revolution to craft an architecture of the new order of things. The materials, forms, and symbolisms, sexually regenerative in part, uh, of Ricardo Porro, Roberto Gotardi, and Vittorio Garata's extraordinary Havana art schools, for instance, remain singular. They depended in part uh, for their meaning on the expropriation, and yes, linguistic reversal, for indeed this extraordinary um, landscape with its celebration of a kind of totally invented Afro-Cuban modernism uh, was built on the former most elite and exclusive golf course uh, of Havana. Now, as well known, the project was to remain unfinished for decades, many of its spaces never serving for further innovation and crafting of a Cuban revolutionary formal expression. The architects went into exile so that the most profound influence of what you see here on the screen of this architecture that sought to create an imagined formal uh, vocabulary derived from an Afro-Cuban past is to be found perhaps in the schools that one of the authors, Ricardo Porro, is still building to this day in the suburbs of Paris after Castro finally granted him the right to emigrate. <laughs> 
And it is indeed the forms of expression most overtly given over to the representation of the regime that ultimately do not exert revolutionary potential, but rather the desire for revenge. The demolition, for instance, of the Palace of the People in the former East Berlin, here captured when its fate was literally put in doubt, in Zweifel, uh, in the brilliant installation of the Berlin-based Norwegian artist Lars Romberg, is a case in point. So is, of course, the recent reconstruction of the Cathedral of the Savior in Moscow on the site of the vast swimming pool of the Khrushchev period that itself was built on the land cleared by demolishing the original cathedral to make way for the planned Palace of the Soviets. All of this played out a scenario we have already seen on the Montagne Saint Genevieve in Paris a hundred years earlier. Revolution and the quest for monumental permanence never have conjugated grammatically. But one other, another, but, um, one other level, uh, at another level, the question of structural versus programmatic revolution as the real source of design transformation is perhaps more of a red herring than a red flag. For as I tried to show, both have effects, and many times they share experiments on the largest level. The technologies of changing consciousness through the geometric arrays of body and space was shared by the French and industrial revolutions, for instance. Technological changes were as radically adapted to the power of economic expansion and the march of capital as they were to the propaganda ends of those who rallied to Das Kapital in the search to effect revolution. And this does not seem to have changed. Although if we were to believe the, the past few weeks of The Economist, itself maybe not to be believed when it comes to these matters, uh, Economist covers, uh, we would need to, put, uh, to opt for the notion, these are within two weeks of one another, this one, and this one, uh, <clears throat> we would need to opt for the notion that it's the long-term effects, as they would like us to believe, of technical and economic revolutions that have the most far-reaching effects, while even revolutions with staying power, such as the Cuban Revolution, which will turn 55 next year, ultimately they would like us to be sure, will crumble. Not that in the long run the theory of creative destruction, that it is increasingly a mantra of the doctrine of progress, and more recently of financial revolutions performed in its name, are not equally destructive. And it is interesting to note that today it is the long reach of technological change rather than the short-term effects of propaganda that seem to have the longest and the most unpredictable effects, if even only to judge by the anxiety that China has over Apple and its products of the internet much more than overt forms of what it views as capitalist propaganda. Today, of course, when the term revolution is used so easily and freely in advertising that the hyperbolic is harder to discriminate from the truly transformative, this question is all the more difficult to answer. But there is no doubt that the iPhone is fundamentally changing consciousness, but it seems to do so in a neutral way. On the one hand, creating subjects who are in a state of perpetual distraction, how many of you have connected to reality out there while I have been speaking? Precisely the least likely place for any form of programmatic revolution to take place. On the other hand, an indispensable tool to the Occupy movements across the nation, the continent, and the globe. And for a while, it was thought that the Arab Spring would have been impossible without social media. The question remains as ambiguous as it was in the ambiguous final chapter of Le Corbusier's programmatic avant-garde manifesto, Vers une architecture an article that had originally appeared in L'Esprit Nouveau, Architecture or Revolution? Question mark. And this in the same years in which his counterpart, Ginsburg, in style and epic, harnessed the entire history and method of 19th century theories of historical change to argue for the revolution's ability to mobilize radical stylistic change. Le Corbusier sided in the end with the technological revolution. And he says, in every domain of industry, new problems have been posed and new tolls capable of solving them have been created. If we set this fact against the past, there is revolution. Now here was a politically neutral endorsement of change of style, if ever there was one, in the force of the pace, a pace of technological change. The argument turns to the pressing needs of housing for the working classes. Much as there would be an exchange of form between Ginsburg's Narcomphan Flats and Le Corbusier's radical reappraisal of dwelling in his architecture, it is interesting to end with the rather unprogrammatic, unrevolutionary observation that in these key texts of 1923-24, Ginsburg and Le Corbusier, one, ce one celebrates the ability to create the housing that is the veritable expression of the revolution. In its heroic opening years in Russia, that is Ginsburg, while the other, celebrates the very same housing that it might indeed avoid revolution. The various working classes of society 
Corbusier concludes, no longer have suitable shelter, neither into laborers nor intellectuals. It is a question of building that is key to the equilibrium upset today, architecture or revolution. It seems to me, and I, to end, I'm sorry, with more questions than answers, in the midst of, these are just some works that we've been thinking about this issue in the exhibition program at MoMA and the current exhibition. In the midst of the current foreclosed crisis, freshly returned from the Society of Architectural Historians annual meeting in Detroit, these questions seem to me, in fact, a burning actuality. So just these, as I say, random thoughts return back into my own work as a historian of revolution uh, and the notion that it seems to me what you're thinking about uh, is uh, extremely difficult but of enormous uh, actuality. Thank you very much. Did you want questions? Thank you, Baron. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If anyone has any questions at all, I think that Baron has given us a great deal. Sorry, Barry has given us a great deal to, uh, to contemplate. So if anyone would like to ask a question, I will supply you with a microphone. No one at all? They're all having a, a Prosecco devolution. <laughs> Testing? OK. Um, is this too loud? Um, with regard to sort of um, the Pantheon and, and sort of issues nowadays in stock architects, do you think that some of this sort of design revolution can come not just from a designer like a souffle, uh, or sort of similar people today, but sort of from the bottom up or in more complex, nuanced ways? Um, from the bottom up, you mean what? From, from the people, from individual designers who are not programmatic? Or, or maybe from engineers or just or sort of government institutions that are not so explicitly design-oriented or, or not so much sort of um, um, seen as sort of a famous designer per se. I mean, I know the bottom up sounds kind of like sort of stupid in a way, but just that sort of a. Well, no, no, I think, it, I think it's actually, I mean, maybe I wasn't explicit enough, but I think it is one issue that I was trying to think about on your invitation, which was really ultimately in the end, although the factories that I showed you don't have a very high status in the his, most histories of architecture. It's rather these architect design buildings, many of them very, very programmatic. And so certainly, for at least two generations of historians interesting, interested in reading the political content of artistic practices and architectural practices, these more programmatic ones would seem to be the more revealing. Uh, but one could really ask the question if it wasn't, in fact, uh, the, utilitar the, the consequences of the utilitarian designs of those factories, whatever ends they might, you know, the, uh, the unintended consequences almost that are, um, are far more consequential uh, than what I've tried to demonstrate, this kind of instability of, of meaning, of, of kind of over-determined uh, and uh, over-programmatic um, uh, architecture. I think it gets very difficult, however, to, I, I chose, even though I'm also a curator of design, to deal with my real field, which is architecture, rather than to look uh, at the history of design objects, even though I evoked the inevitable apple. But I think what I, you know, here it becomes extremely difficult because now every product that's introduced on the market is a revolution. I mean, the, re the idea of revolution has actually become a, a kind of marketing strategy that, that appeals to people. might even be a little bit unfair, so you'll forgive me. But uh, I just was noting in, in the, especially in I think the first list of revolutions that you gave, the absence of the American Revolution, right? And this sort of, uh, the, the extent to which we can conceive, I mean, uh, to what extent would the sort of lack or the relative lack of sort of built condition, right, for the, pl I mean, obviously there was a built condition, but relative to Paris, one would say. Right. Uh, uh, I don't know if impoverished is the right word, but uh, something of a different sort of built condition. If that, if that produces a, a different set of trajectories in terms of how you're considering these transformations of monumentality, or if, there, I mean, if the American Revolution sort of intersects with or interrupts uh, the sort of structure well, that you put in place here. In, in a certain sense, there are multiple questions there. One is one that's been debated by historians for many, many generations uh, about whether the American Revolution and the French Revolution have a, have a status. You know, to a certain extent,
the um, you know the American Revolution is treated in American historiography as a revolution and is generally treated in European historiography as part of a war uh, with a rebellion embedded in it. Um, nonetheless, uh, you know, and then there was this whole debate whether George Washington should be the first king of this rebelled place. Um, and the, so that's, that's sort of one thing that we could debate. I'm not a historian of revolution, so I can't really totally um, uh, weigh in on that. I did, when I was writing my textbook, regret that I had to drop out something that I'm very interested in, which is French-American design exchanges in the 1790s. Because the, the most interesting thing is that because the, the US basically doesn't build its capital until the 1790s, the construction of the icono iconography and the architecture of the young American Republic is completely contemporary with the first French Republic. And there are enormous exchanges between the revolutionary transformation of Paris and the, um, you know, the creation of Washington, DC. So your question, in that sense, uh, is really an excellent one. I don't know if it's unfair. I think it's excellent. Um, because one could say, wouldn't it be an interesting laboratory uh, to put these American events parallel uh, to the French ones? Because in fact, they're not undone. So you don't have you know, you don't have the end of the French Revolutionary decade. You don't have the, um, <clears throat> you know, Napoleon the first declaring himself empire. You don't, uh, emperor. You don't have the transformation of the revolutionary project into one of, um, uh, of uh, conquest. So uh, I think that would, that would be a fascinating thing to, to, um, uh, to study. That's another completely different subject than, than revolution per se. But, you know, why is it? that American architectural history and modern architectural history tend to be written down in two different places so that uh, North America's place in the world in the 18th and 19th century is uh, uh, art history has never come to terms with. You have historians of American art and historians of a, maybe, maybe Lauren. Maybe it's done here. I, I come from a, 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 a recalcitrant institution. Um, <laughs> Well, so. ju just to follow up on that, I'm going to speak to something which Laura could speak to better, probably. But one of those guys who's doing this, is na his name is Pierre L'Enfant. Mm -hmm. And uh, he works both sides of the revolution because it's so unpleasant for the Americans to have to use uh, English design vocabulary after they just had this little conflict with them, which you characterize as a war. And they like to call it something much more glorious. Right. but just a figure that, that Pierre L'Enfant uses, and it's on, it's the Phrygian cap. That sort of represents the difference between those two. And it's on this, uh, the China that he designs for George Washington's uh, Society of the Cincinnati. Right. It's all over the China. Right. And the Phrygian, lucky it's nice and small, because it's a big problem. And um, it gets more and more problematic as they see what transpires. And uh, Even more problematic was <coughs> to answer Lecoq Gaulois that Benjamin Franklin wanted the Turkey. And there was even a yeah, that, well, that, that was Turkey the, that on the been dome nice of the too. new Capitol building. But uh, happily, that did not prevail. We only got tobacco and corn on the interior. But it, it, it's very interesting if you want to just track that. And it's one thing that recently, like the New York Historical Society tried to do, was to follow the Phrygian cap and its sort of disappearance mm -hmm. in these uh, revolutions. And of course, uh, it pops up in, uh, in, so in a different it, way in the Haitian it? one if you want to go the real trajectory of revolution mm -hmm. and pick a design element that you can you know, you know, extract and take in different contexts. And Laura's done that really well. She's referring to an article that I wrote, published in 18th Century Studies, which essentially looks at the excision of the Phrygian cap from American visual culture in the 1790s. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> I have to catch up on my bibliography. I'm quite all right. I'm sure you have better reading to do. <laughs> at least I hope you have better reading to do. Uh, any, yes, over to you. Sarah, thank you um, for a wonderful talk. Um, one of the things that interests me, I guess, as a historian, historian of science, you kind of ended on this idea of architecture or revolution, and the idea of kind of that in our present revolution is automated, 
or it's a, it itself is a techne. And sort of, I kind of was wondering if you thought that at this juncture of history, kind of um, design discourse almost replaces discourses of revolution and politics. Is, is that a possibility that there's something almost um, idiosyncratic in the title of this uh, conference or intriguing in terms of trying to keep history and revolution alive with design in the sense of how we approach sociopolitical problems in the present, or whether you see that as a change. I wasn't sure if you were applying that in the contemporary present, um, revolution is so automated and design has replaced it as a discourse of transformation to a point where um, I guess that in some sense we have certain questions about how do we think about politics or revolution at all. Too hard a question, but it is tough. I almost, yeah. I almost thought that's what you were implying. I guess I was. Well, wondering the, if I was wrong. So I might not have made it clear that when I was saying architecture or revolution, I was quoting Le Corbusier. So what I was really trying to do in, in, in shorthand, I suppose, what that would have been a topic for a completely different lecture, is to point out the extent to which the artistic avant-garde's in the early 20th century were rarely involved in any kind of revolutionary uh, political project uh, of any sort. And uh, you know, I think from if you were to take a Marxist perspective, Corbusier is a deeply uh, conservative figure. Um, so I was kind of using that, um, you know, I mean, admittedly, they were really uh, little sketchy notes at the end, but I didn't want to, uh, to leave us at the threshold of the 19th century. Um, but I do, I mean, I do think that's exactly where we are all wondering. Uh, you drive as I did last week, the streets in Michigan, and you wonder, you know, how is it possible? Is, the, is there the possibility of political revolution? I mean, during the whole Occupy uh, uh, events of last year, uh, you know, I think this was on all of our minds. Uh, is there, uh, are there the possibilities of, you know, radical social and political upheaval uh, uh, and change? Uh, you know, or are we going to be content with? Uh, uh, you know, Apple products that on one level, you know, sort of satiate us in a continual world of total distraction. That's why I asked the, 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 even the question. I mean, I, that's not a topic for me. I'm not really a historian of contemporary design, but I think that would be a very fascinating paper I would have loved to heard in this context is, you know, what is, what is the, you know, what is the iPhone? that sense. Obviously, it's an enabler of sets of social relations that were completely unimaginable even 30 years ago. Um, but, but what is it? I mean, we know it's, I didn't bring them in. I had one whole slide, which I dropped out when I tried to make this shorter earlier today. But I did have one whole slide of all of the Apple advertisements that use the word revolution. You know, they don't design a product that is not revolutionary. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think that I feel like we should uh, give Barry a huge no, round of applause and thanks. <laughs>